especially when we use the one we've got. Be a good witness. Praise the Lord. Glad you're here this morning. Glorious day on the outside. It's a good day on the inside when we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord and recognize Him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Trust the King of your life this morning. Pick your Bibles down and turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. Beginning our reading this morning with verse 1. Matthew, chapter 21, verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then then sent Jesus two of his disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, me, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they sat him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and straw them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he was come unto Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. Let's ask God's anointing and blessing to be upon his word and upon each of us as we listen together today to what the Spirit says to the church. Our Father, we rejoice in the day that you've given unto us. We rejoice in this beautiful Sunday. We rejoice, Lord, in the significance of this day. For on this day we celebrate the triumphant ride of Jesus Christ into that holy city of Jerusalem. Lord, I pray that as we celebrate together here this morning, that we might always be mindful of your word, the truth of your word. May we be lifted up in our spirit. I pray that for those of us who know Christ as Lord, that we might leave this service today rejoicing. May we leave the service today lifted up in our spirit, knowing that we can go out and face today and tomorrow and whatever the future may hold. Because we will leave this house this morning with Christ reigning supreme in our life. And Lord, if there are those here who have never made a commitment to Christ, I pray that you will speak today. May this be a day when many others will rejoice in Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. For it is in the name of Jesus, my Lord, that I pray. Amen. The Passover time was approaching. Jesus went to a hillside and was there with his 12 disciples. They followed him to that hillside approximately 15,000 people. The Bible says there were 5,000 men, not including the women and children. So if you had the women and children, probably have a crowd of about 15,000 people. And as they listened to Jesus talk, they had been for some time without food. And Jesus said to disciples, we've got to feed these people. Because there's no way in the economy of the day that any of the surrounding area would be able to feed such a multitude of people but there's no food available. Finally, Jesus has five little biscuits. If you read the Bible, it talks about five loaves. Those loaves are actually little biscuits. Five barley biscuits, the food of the poor people. He had two fish. And Jesus said to that multitude, I want you to be seated. He 
hear this great crowd of 15,000 or more people. They're seated on the ground, and then Jesus takes those little barley cakes. And the two fish, and I can see him as he placed them in his hand, and there's a hush that comes upon the multitude. Jesus then lifts those little biscuits. He fish to the Lord and prays. He offers his prayer, and after the prayer, Jesus begins to take those little biscuits, and he begins to break it off. And he put it into a basket. He said to the disciples, take this and give it to me. And he said, not a basket. And he began to pray. Take this to the people. 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 And he broke the fish and he said, take this to the people. And this continued over and over and over and over again. The disciples came back and he continued to break from those little biscuits. And so finally, that entire multitude of 15,000 plus were all faith. A miracle. A miracle. 15,000 people could be fed on what one person could consume in just one meal. But after it is over, Jesus says to the disciples, I want you to go out among the people and I want you to pick up what's left over. And the miracle of miracles, after the bread and the fish were taken up, there were 12 basketfuls left over. More than they had at the beginning. The multitude is astonished. Unbelievable that this can happen. In the excitement of the moment, the multitude sees this man Jesus as their Messiah, as their Lord. The one who will be able to take care of all of our needs and feed us when we are hungry. And immediately, in the joy and the excitement of the moment, they say, let's make him our king. Let's make him our Messiah. Turn to John's Gospel, chapter 6. John's Gospel, chapter 6. verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Jesus saw these people are going to force me to be their king. They're excited. It's a, it's a glorious day. It's a happy experience. And now in the excitement of the moment, they're going to make me their king. Christ would have nothing to do with it. But he would have parted in the mountain alone. Now we go forward just about one year. In fact, a year and a few days. Again, we are at the Passover. People have gathered from all areas around the then known world. Jews coming to Jerusalem. The one time of the year when, when all of God's people would gather in Jerusalem. It was a happy time. It's like a homecoming. They all came together and they saw family and friends they had not seen for years. Not since the last Passover, anyhow. Some had missed and, and it would be a time, at least once a year, that they could all get together. It was a glorious time, a happy time, a time when they would celebrate the Passover, remembering that, that God Almighty had passed over Israel. And the firstborn in Egypt were destroyed. And so they had gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate this time. And I can almost hear the multitude. Many had heard about this man called Jesus. They'd never seen him. They'd heard of his miracles. They heard about the time he fed the 5,000, 15,000. They heard about all of his miracles of healing and, and his tremendous teaching. And so throughout Jerusalem and the surrounding area, there was a, a buzz going on. I wonder if Jesus is going to be here. I wonder if we're going to be able to see this Jesus. On that morning, Jesus, who had spent the night with his friend at Bethany, the next morning he got up and he and his disciples began to make their way into Jerusalem. Today is going to be different. On that day a year before, he had refused to be their king. He would not allow them to make him their king. 
and today he is going to offer himself as their Messiah, their King. And so Jesus and his disciples began their walk into Jerusalem. And no doubt the word has spread before him. He's on his way. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem, the pilgrims began to make their way out on the road leading to Bethany. They want to see this Jesus. Great multitudes begin to crowd the highway, which is nothing more than a, than a highway with dust and dirt, no paper. Jesus arrives fairly near Jerusalem, and he stops and sends two of his disciples and says, I want you to go into the village, and there you're going to find a coat. You knew exactly where the coat would be, told him exactly where to find it. Did you go in and you lose that coat? He knew what would happen when you began to lose the coat. And the owner is going to say, what in the world are you doing taking this coat? Jesus knew that. He said, now if they ask you that, just tell them the Lord has to do that. Imagine that. With all the strangers and the visitors coming to Jerusalem, that these people are going to allow Two men they have never seen, know nothing about, just take the donkey and bring it back to Christ. They go into Jerusalem, they find the coat exactly where Christ said it would be. The question is actually asked exactly as Christ said it would be. They gave the answer, and away they come to the coat of Jesus. And when they arrive back at Jesus with the coat, the multitudes now have made their way out of Jerusalem. And from the surrounding, they're converging on this point where Christ is. When the cold is brought to Christ, the cold has never been trained to be riding, to be ridden. No one had ever ridden the cold before. The disciples, they put their cloaks over the donkey's back. The donkey in Israel was a symbol of peace and royalty, not the common donkey you will see in America. It was a stated creature, a creature that said, there is royalty here. And it's a symbol of peace. And here Christ, he mounts this donkey. It's on the donkey's back, a symbol of royalty. I am your king. I am your Messiah. And a symbol of peace. Wow. Symbol of royalty and peace all combined in the person of Jesus Christ. And as Christ mounts this donkey, there are those in the multitude who are very familiar with their Bibles. And they go back and they remember that Zechariah had said something about this. The prophet Zechariah said, Listen, rejoice, O daughter. Rejoice, O Jerusalem. For your king is coming to you, riding upon a donkey. And suddenly they are filled again with joy. The day has come. The day we have waited centuries for. Our Messiah is here. Down through that, down that road and all back through the valley begins to arrive from the lips of the people. Hosanna! Hosanna! Praise be to God! Now our Messiah has a, arrived. And I can almost see the, the, the dancing in the streets and the joy and the praise as, as people begin to take off their cloaks and they lay it down the road for the Messiah to ride over. The palm trees were stripped of their branches and placed in the road the way they would do it to any arriving monarch. And so the road is, is laced with palm trees and garments that people laid in the way. And Jesus makes his march into Jerusalem amidst the cry of praise and hosanna. This is our king. This is our Messiah. But you know, not everyone in that town were believers. The Pharisees said, Master, rebuke your disciples. This cannot happen. You remember the Pharisees were great... Uh, adversaries of Christ. He said, Master, rebuke your disciples. You know what Jesus said to them? Jesus said, I'm going to tell you something. If these were to hold their peace, the very rocks would cry out. A day of triumph, a day of joy, a day when Israel will recognize their king. And he publicly accepts their praise and their declaration of Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. A day of rejoicing, a day of praise, a day of excitement. Rising in Jerusalem, amid the cross. Jesus planned the day, well planned. His people from all around the 
then known world would accept him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And every year we celebrate that triumphant entry. We call it Palm Sunday. But you know, there are a lot of people today just like the multitude in Christ's day. Those in Christ, they were simply caught up in the excitement of the moment. It's exciting to be in a great crowd of people and see here one who is a great miracle worker, one who had the power to, to feed multitudes, the one who could actually raise the dead as he had Lazarus, the one who could heal the sick, the one who could bring so much joy and happiness into the life. And so suddenly here, amidst the joy and the praise and excitement, all the people joined together in the excitement of the moment. But it was not a commitment to Christ. Well, I am fairly sure that many in this same multitude, just a few days later, with equal enthusiasm, will cry, crucify him, crucify him. What a difference a few days today. You know, there are a lot of people today, I'm afraid, caught up in that same excitement. There are a lot of people today who will go to church on Sunday. We'll step on toes now, so get ready. A lot of people go to church on Sunday. And they will get all excited about singing hymns and praise and all of that. In fact, there are some people who go to church on Sunday, and if there is not a lot of excitement, if there's not a lot of hype and a lot of, of whatever goes on that, that does something on the inside, you feel like that, well, I really haven't been to church. All of their Christianity, all of their... Their, their Christian faith is based on excitement. I may go to church, I get really excited, and I get thrilled, and I get lifted up, and, and uh, you know, whether they get anything else or not, it doesn't really matter, just as long as I get stirred up, and as long as something good happens, and I leave here, wow, it's been great. Then go to work on Monday, and it's a whole different story. On Sunday, there may be the raise of the hands in praise and adoration. I praise God for people who love to raise their hands in praise. I praise God. I like excitement. I love to go to church and pat my foot, and I like to get up and walk around, and, you know, I don't have any fun people praising the Lord and shouting and dancing in church. Great. I think we need a church that is alive and vibrant and vigorous. I'm going to tell you something. When the shouting and the praising is over, you've got to walk straight line. A lot of people go to church on Sunday and they will praise the Lord and they'll sing the praises and they feel good if they've made a commitment to the Lord and, and they go to work on Monday. By their life, by their lifestyle, by the words they speak, they say over again, crucify him, crucify him. He is not my Savior. I'll not live for Him. I'll not be the person He wants me to be. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do things my way. I'll go to church on Sunday. Well, maybe. But I may go to church on Sunday. And when I go, you better entertain me. You better make me feel good. When I leave, I want to feel real good. But I don't want Christ to have anything to do with my life from Monday that's the multitude that had come. In the excitement of the moment, there was joy and anticipation. Praise be to God. He will be our Messiah. He will be our King. But just a few days later, when everything changes, today, crucify him. Crucify him. He will not be our Savior. We celebrate today as the the triumphant entry of Christ into Jerusalem. Now, let me tell you this morning. That day was not the triumphant entry of Christ. That's yet to be. That is yet to be. There is coming a time when Jesus Christ will ride triumphantly, not into Jerusalem, 
that he is going to come back to his world. And he is going to come triumphantly as King of Kings and as Lord of Lords. That day is still in the future. But there is coming that day when he will come back to his world. He prophesied that himself. Jesus said, if I go away, I will come again. Jesus spoke of this day in his trial, if you remember, before Caiaphas, the high priest. Turn back to Matthew chapter 26, if you will. Matthew chapter 26, verse 64. Notice what Christ said, speaking of this coming day of triumphant entry. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. That's the triumphant entry of Christ when he is going to return as a triumphant ruler, as the King of kings and as the Lord of lords. He spoke about it. He prophesied that day would come. That day has already been planned for, my friends. I believe that day is very, very near at hand. Very near at hand. Jesus spoke of his plans and revealed his plans for that day. Turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Jesus spoke of that coming day of triumph. And verse 30. Notice what Jesus says. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Christ said, they is going to come. I am going to come as Messiah. I am going to come as the King of Kings. And on that day, not only will people be gathered in and around Jerusalem as they did on this day, but the Bible says from every corner under the heaven, the people are going to be gathered together to witness the coming of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Paul encourages the saints at Corinth all down through the history of the church, the great promise of the coming of Christ, the anticipation of the triumphal entry of Christ into a world that is plagued with sin has been the hope of the church. And Paul writing to those Christians at Corinth, he wrote to encourage them on this day. Turn to, uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. Paul says, Behold, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep. We're not all going to die. Some of us going to be living when Christ returns. But we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of eye, at the last trump. That's what Christ said in Matthew 24. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That will happen at the entrance again of Jesus Christ into his world. The triumphant entry of Christ into his world. What a comfort that was to the early Christian to know that the Messiah, that Jesus was going to come again as a triumphant King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. To the Christians who were sorrowing at the loss of their loved ones, Christ would encourage them through the Apostle Paul. Notice in the 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. Notice what the scripture says. 413, that I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Here it is. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Notice the picture. Christ coming in the clouds of glory, coming triumphantly into his world. The dead in Christ are going to be raised first. And then the scripture says, Then we which are alive and remain will be gathered up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, greeting our triumphant Messiah, our King of kings, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
You talk about excitement. You talk about a day of great joy. What a day that will be. The day the church has always looked forward to. The triumphant entry of Christ into his world to see his people. And when that day comes, when that day comes, when Christ enters into his world, let me assure you, there will be no doubters. There will be no unbelievers. There are people today who doubt that there is a Christ, that he is coming again. There are those today who say, well, I don't know so much about this coming again of Christ. Listen, on that day when Jesus comes the second time, there's going to be no doubters. There's going to be no unbelievers. I guarantee you on that day, every person will be a believer. They will see him coming in the clouds of glory. And every person that has ever lived on that day will acknowledge him as King of kings and Lord of lords. Turn to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord. No words, it's going to happen. Every knee, every knee, every person that has ever lived, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us should give an account of himself to God. That's why I say on that day there could be no unbelievers. I guarantee it doesn't matter this morning whether you believe in Christ or not. It doesn't matter whether you've whether you made your life to him or not. I guarantee you on that coming day when the Lord returns, the Bible says you're going to bow your knee, and you're going to say this is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Every knee, every person will bow to Christ as King of Kings. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's going to happen. Every person, no unbelievers, on that day, all will be believers. And Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So listen, the day of belief for some is going to be too late. It's going to be too late. No unbelievers, but some will become believers too late. For you see, once Christ leaves that throne in heaven, today the Bible says he is there as our mediator. He is there to bring us to God. He is the, the go-between between us and God. But listen, when Christ leaves that mediatorial throne and begins his way back to this earth the second time, it's too late. Salvation is over. No more hope. Hope forever will be gone. When Christ comes back, he is coming as Messiah. He is coming as King of kings and Lord of lords, but also as judge. And once he leaves that throne, there are going to be many, the Bible says there are going to be many who will look up and profess, down and say, oh, this is Jesus Christ. This is the Lord. We believe that he is. The Bible says it's going to be too late. The only way you and I can join in the happy song of the blessed, the only way we can rejoice in joy at the coming again of Jesus Christ is if we make him Lord of our life now. If we ask him to come into our life and make him king of our life now, we sing the song, King of my life, I crown thee now. And that means more than joining a church. It means more than saying, I believe in Christ. It means that I believe that Jesus Christ came and that he's coming again. It means that I believe that Christ paid it all on Calvary. It means that I know that one day Jesus will literally and visibly and physically return to this earth. It means that I know that my sins are forgiven and I know that right now, today, if the sky should roll back and I see Jesus coming, I can kneel before him and say, this is my king, this is my Lord. Every 
other person will bow to me again say, This is the Lord. But only those who have made a commitment to him will be his The others he will say, Depart from me, I know you're not. Bible says they will be destroyed in a literal burning of their on that day in Jerusalem said, Hosanna, feel with joy. A few days later, they say, crucify him, crucify him. Let me ask you this morning, this question is closing. Are you really ready for the triumphant entry He's coming to his world. You're going to be a believer one day. Why not accept Christ today? If not only is your Savior, but is your Lord. If I need to be your king today, so that when he does come, then along with the, the saints for all the ages, the resurrection, you'll be caught up in the crowd. So shall we be. The day is coming. Into his Christ. If not, today you still see it at the right hand of God to make intercession. One day. Today is our day. Father, I am grateful for your word. I'm thankful, Lord, that there was that day when you allowed your people. To proclaim you as Lord and Messiah. Lord, oftentimes we are guilty, perhaps, of the same thing. There may be those times when we rejoice and we get all excited about Christ in church. And then on the tomorrow and the rest of the week when things get tough, by our words, by our actions, and by our thoughts, we may be guilty also of saying crucify. Crucify. Lord, if there are those here this morning who need to make commitments to you, invite you to be Lord of their life. I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak just now. May there be decisions made for Christ. bow just before we sing up again. I wonder if there are those here this morning. Maybe you know in your heart that you're not really ready for the coming of Christ. you like to be prayed for before we sing this close to you. But you'll get ready. you make that decision. Now raise your hand and take it down. I'll pray for you. You have seen the hands that I've lifted here this morning. Lord, there are those who want to be ready. And I pray that as we prepare to sing our closing hymn this morning, may your Holy Spirit move in each of our lives. And especially, Lord, those whose hands have been uplifted today, I pray that even now as we pray together, I pray that the heart will be open. Christ will be invited in to be King, to be Lord, right now. So that on that day when you do return triumphantly, together, we can greet 